Okay, hello. Um, drinking water today. Um, part one of this series was about nationalistic chain reactions in Europe from 1815 to 1914. And I think if we look at it carefully, you, or if a person looks at it carefully, they can see that there was a whole series of events that were related and then led to chain reactions in most cases leading up to July 28, 1914, unfortunately, and even to today, in fact. On the last video, we, I mean, I say we, me talking, you listening, but people do interact with commentaries, so that's good. We talked about the situation after the defeat of Napoleon and the French revolutionaries in 1815, their final defeat at war. And the Con Congress of Vienna, <laughs> yeah, you can see how my graphics are so fantastic, but the Congress of Vienna and the situation in Europe, right? And uh, you could see Spain, Portugal were established as countries pretty much haven't changed in hundreds of years. France, uh, then we got Sweden controlling Norway, Kingdom of Denmark, Russia, Great Britain, and Ireland, and all of that. Okay, but you can see the very um, confused situation in Central Europe. And there was a strong empire in Southeast, well, a large empire in Southeastern Europe, the Ottoman Empire, the Turkish Ottoman Empire. I don't know how strong it was. It was actually known as the sick man of Europe. So a big part of this nationalism is here, the, the, a map showing the races of Europe. And oftentimes the borders did not line up with the language groups, even today, like in Ukraine. You'll notice Eastern Ukraine is mostly ethnic Russian, Western Ukraine is Ukrainian, Eastern Ukraine is Eastern Orthodox, Western is Roman Catholic, which today doesn't really factor in so much, but at, you know, years ago it did, the religious problem. But there's still the language issue. And that divide there, the Catholic Western Orthodox Eastern really goes back to 1071, uh, 1054 with the Great Schism between the Eastern Orthodox and the Roman Catholic Church, which went back even further to 395 with the division of the empire, the Roman Empire into two areas, the Eastern and Western empires, administrative districts with two separate capitals, and two emperors, but it was uh, supposed to be one empire and divided into two e more easily governing governed parts. But the Western Empire was destroyed by 476. The Eastern Empire continued on until 1453, 1453, when the Ottoman Turkish Empire overthrew it. And that lasted until 1918, well, 1923 technically, when the last Sultan, the Turkish Emperor, the Sultan was expelled. But anyway, Okay, so the last video we have, we'll go around Europe. Russia had been consolidated under the Romanovs, the Tsars, in the 1600s, and their empire continued to grow. And they stretched, the Russian empire stretched from Poland east all the way to Alaska, which they sold to the United States in 1867, <clears throat> very foolishly because they thought it was sort of a worthless territory and they needed money plus they needed friends, ha ha ha, yeah, friends, right? So see how that worked out, but uh, they needed friends in their struggle with Great Britain, but they needed cash and they got it. If they'd have held on to Alaska, they'd have realized that it was full of gold <coughs> and, and black gold, petroleum, and they could have made $7 million at, in that $7 million 1867 money every week, So, but they didn't know you don't know, you don't know. All right. Then we go up to Finland, which was part of Russia. Okay. It's never an independent country until 1917. Sweden, which got control of Norway from Denmark. Denmark's punishment in 
at the conclusion of the Napoleonic conflict was to lose Norway and have to give that territory up to Sweden. And then Norway revolted against Sweden in 1905 and established an independent kingdom, which it is today. Most people don't realize that Norway has only been independent for 110 years. Okay, Great Britain and Ireland united as the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Ireland with a single parliament in London in 1801, January 1801. <clears throat> and then you have the Irish nationalism, which was a sort of a thorn in the side of the British, but that didn't really come to a head until 1916. All right, we go to the Low Countries, the Netherlands, which until the Napoleonic times was just the Netherlands, the Independent Netherlands, the United Netherlands, and the Austrian Netherlands, Belgium and Luxembourg, the Austrian Netherlands. After Napoleon was defeated, they did not give the Netherlands back to Austria they gave it to the kingdom, this new kingdom of the Netherlands. And we already talked about how Belgium broke away in 1830 after a revolt and got their own kingdom. And Luxembourg continued to be, well, the western part of Luxembourg was given to Belgium, but the eastern part continued as a country, but under the kingdom of the Netherlands until 1891 because of uh, a rule that women could not inherit the throne, the Grand Duchy of Luxembourg became independent. We go down into France. France was always a, always a country, really, since the days of Hugh Capet, but <laughs> after 1815, you know, they had the uh, Kingdom of France, restored the Bourbons under Louis the 18th Bourbon, and then his brother, Charles the 10th Bourbon, And then there was a revolt against him in 1830 because he was an ultra conservative and liberals of various uh, shades didn't like him. And then there was a, a look at, like a communist revolution in 1830, but the radicals, the Jacobins, the communists were defeated. And so uh, the, the uh, cadet branch of Bourbon, the Bourbon family, the house of Bourbon Orleans under <coughs> Prince Louis Philippe came to power and he was going to be the moderate, you know, I'm the moderate, I'm the people's king. He wore trousers like the working man, you know, so he was a pretty slick politician, lived in a big, you know, big chalet, a big mansion, but uh, he was smart, you know, he presented himself as this working man's king and we're going to have democracy and it's going to be wonderful, you know, and so um, he was supported by most of the factions, not the hardcore bourbons, but um, they didn't have a whole lot of support. So they never did get back into power after 1830. But uh, Bourbon Orleans is in power, but they became, like most of these politicians, are really after their own power. And so over the next 18 years, the, the King Louis Philippe, the citizen king, as they called him, became more of a dictator and less of a citizen king. He was just showing his true colors. And of course the left wing, the, the Jacobins and the ancient, you know, the French ancient uh, Orient uh, Freemasons and um, liberals of various stripes want to have another uprising. So they, they had the great uprising of 1848 which we have to keep referencing throughout this. This was the great big communist uprising of 1848, where they, they figured we're gonna overthrow all of Europe and then overthrow the world. Well, initially it looked like this revolution would succeed. France, Germany, all the German states, <clears throat> Poland, Italy, not Great Britain. They had headed off a revolution by um, adopting more and more uh, social welfare policies socialism so i mean why have a revolution when you got it you know why have a socialist revolution when you have a socialist country right so that was in 1832 with those reforms in great britain but so <clears throat> the radicals as normal as they tend to do they bite off more than they can chew and they overreach so Whereas the common man the common people might just want some changes and reforms and some more freedoms 
here come here here come these reds and they they're about you know mass executions and taking everybody's private property and outlawing religion and uh the people say wait a minute we don't want all that and of course the business people say what the hell so then you have this sort of a counter revolution to a various extent and the, the more conservative liberals come into power and that happened in germany and that happened in france with the rising we talked about this of louis louis napoleon who comes in there in 1848 i'm going to rescue the middle class from these damned radicals and he's going to protect the catholics you know he wants to make sure people say i'm catholic i'm catholic and I'm nominally at least i don't practice it but or believe it but it, it looks good on tv well you know they didn't have tv back then but you know what i mean it looks good in the media so um he comes to power and france sets up the third uh, the, excuse me the second republic the first republic was in 18 uh, 1792 but the second republic president louis napoleon and we're going to have democracy and we're going to protect the middle class and we're going to be very friendly to the industrialists and it's going to be wonderful so donald trump i mean um <clears throat> Louis Napoleon becomes President Napoleon, Louis Napoleon of France, but he's got uh, other ideas, of course. And just like his uncle, uh, Napoleon Bonaparte, he says, well, maybe uh, we need more power to protect ourselves from these radicals, these communists. And on the right side, these bourbons who want to set up a, a divine right monarchy again, we don't want that. So and then he's going to say, so. Do you think it's a good idea that I could have more power and they have elections? Oh, sure, you know. And then um, 1852, well, if the people insist, uh, maybe I could be Emperor Napoleon. I don't really want the job, but, um, and they have this election. Should President Napoleon be Emperor Napoleon? And they say, yeah, yeah. So they have, he said, I was elected to this. I mean, if they insist, what can I do? That's the voice of democracy. I'll be Napoleon III, Emperor of France. Turns out he was pretty successful. The economy thrived. France reached great heights of modern technology and industrial growth, growth from 1848 to 1870 under Louis Napoleon, or Napoleon III, if you're a Napoleonic uh, faction supporter. But uh, his problem, like a lot of these guys, he's he wants to be bigger than he is, like right. So he wants to be this big shot. He's not his uncle, but he wants to be his uncle. He's not going to try to conquer Europe. He's not that stupid, but he he wants France to be this big empire, you know. And during his days, that's when, and even before him, under uh, Louis Philippe, France had taken over Algeria and Tunisia and um, started putting their kind of dabbling in Morocco and some other African territories. And, and uh, then France starts getting involved with the Polynesian islands, which France still owns today, French Polynesia, this vast oceanic empire today. And uh, France gets involved in Indochina by conquering Cochin China. Later, they conquer Annam and Tonkin and Cambodia, 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 or the French say Cambodia, we say Cambodia, Cambodia, and Laos, Laos, and so um, make that French Indochina. But I mean, business is boom, and France has this big economy, but Napoleon had a tendency to be kind of hot-headed and kind of a goof, and um, he did a few little projects that didn't work out so well, like we're going to take over Mexico. And then France went and took over Mexico in 1862 with this kind of trumped up deal. I mean, Mexico had a corrupt government that was very, very bad. And they would borrow money like crazy. And then the Europeans could say, oh, well, pay us back. Oh, well, we can't pay you back. We stole all the money. So the French used that as an excuse to invade. And they got this guy from Austria, Maximilian, a duke to go over there and be the emperor of France, uh, of Mexico, the empire of Mexico. Well, of course, it's supported by French troops, so it's really just a French territory. Everybody knows that. 
after the U.S. war against the South was over in 1865, then the U.S. government is kind of telling France, you really don't want to have a war with us over Mexico, do you? If anybody's going to run Mexico, it's going to be Uncle Sam. It ain't going to be Uncle Napoleon. So Louis Napoleon says, okay, well, we're going to get out of France now. Good luck to you, Maximilian. We're leaving. So good luck, fellow. And then Maximilian has no French support, you know, no troops. So then the Mexicans rose up and he was thrown out and shot. He was overthrown in shot and killed in 1867 and they reestablished the Mexican Republic and they go back to their corrupt ways and so but you know they're stealing from each other instead of France stealing from them and whatever so all right now we go back to Europe <clears throat> Spain was reestablished as an independent kingdom and they had a little Republican uprising and off and on during the years, and then it really reached a peak in eight, in 1931. But that's a story for later. And France is a king. Uh, <laughs> Spain is a kingdom again today, under the Bourbons. Interestingly, Portugal remained under uh, you know uh, a kingdom, but it was overthrown in 1910. And they set up a republic, which it continues to be a republic today. Portugal was the first European country to have empires or they weren't going to take over any European territories. It's a small European country, so there's no chance of that. But Portugal did uh, become experts at seafaring, and they built up a great world empire starting in the 1400s. And they ruled Brazil and vast parts of Africa and Asia. And they continued to rule huge areas of Africa, about the size of the United States until 1975, 40 years ago. And they even ruled parts of China until 1999, just 16 years ago. So the last part of China ruled by foreigners was taken back by China without a war. They agreed they'll turn it back to China in 1999, December 99. Many people are not aware of that. All right, uh, and they lost their Indian territories in 1961 when India attacked Portugal and took their territories. And, uh, but anyway, that's, this is not about overseas empires, right? Just, but there's, it has to be mentioned, okay? So now we go to the more complicated areas, Italy and Germany. Okay, we'll start with Italy. Italy was not a country, okay? Now the French revolutionaries set up this kingdom of Italy during the French Revolution. But it wasn't a real Italian country. It was the Kingdom of Italy under the control of France. And the Italian people knew this, so they didn't go along with this farce, and they revolted against it. They didn't mind a United Italy, necessarily. They don't want a United Italy under the control of France. That is not going to work. All right, so after the Congress of Vienna in 1815, what are they going to do with Italy? Well, the Bourbon King of, Sar of Sicily, Sicily Island in southern Italy, Naples, south of Naples, the boot, the bottom boot, is going to be returned to the Bourbon family of Sicily. And so you see on this map the kingdom of the two Sicilies, Naples and Sicily. Okay, that's all of southern Italy. Again, in 1815, it returns to their rule, the Bourbon family. We're not going to go into who they were. It's, they're not that famous. But it, just, it was a Bourbon dynasty related to the French and the Spanish Bourbons. And they're ultra conservative. They don't want any changes. Well, why would they want changes? They're in control. So these are going to be one of the groups in Europe that don't want change or any kind of revolution. Northern Italy would continue to be this jigsaw puzzle because since the days of the Holy Roman Empire in the Middle Ages, it had been divided up into states, little states. Now, originally it was under control of the Holy Roman Emperor. But that empire lost control of Italy uh, by the end of, you know, the day when the, when the Renaissance came. Okay, so now what are they going to do after the Congress of Vienna? Well, they decide to let these little countries stay independent. In North Eastern Italy, Venice, Venezia, 
Venice does not get its independence back. No, Venice had been an independent country in, in, in its own Mediterranean empire. In fact, they ruled Cyprus Island, Crete, and up and down the Adriatic coast. So Venice itself was a fairly powerful maritime empire. But they never got their independence back after the French came rampaging through there in the 1790s. So it's you know, too bad for you, Venice, but they're going to be turned over to Austria as a reward for fighting Napoleon. So the Austrian Habsburgs, the old ancient Habsburg dynasty from the Middle Ages that had been ruling Austria for all those years and who had always been the Holy Roman emperors, right? And now they're the emperors of Austria because the dukes of Austria now styled themselves since 1806 as or 1805 is emperors of Austria. So Austria gets Venezia. Also Lombardy, from the ancient tribe of the Lombards. Lombardy is given to Austria and they continue to hold on to Tyrol in Northern Italy. So Northeast Italy is gonna remain under Austrian control. Tyrol and some parts of Venezia area like uh, this little area near Trieste is gonna actually remain inside the the German Confederation, which was created in 1815, sort of like a recreation of the old Holy Roman Empire, but without an emperor, just uh, like a council, they call it a diet, like a sort of parliament of the, of the leaders. So parts of Italy remain inside actually Germany, the German Confederation. The other strong, well, the other big area in central Italy is the Papal States various little states under the control of the Pope. There's only one remaining today, Vatican City, but at that time there were many, and they just collectively were called the Papal States. It's own country under the control of the church. Now, there was also the little mini state of San Marino, and there were some other mini states. Well, the Papal States were a little bit bigger than that. They were small, they weren't many, but there were other little tiny states like Lucca, Parma, Modena, just very tiny little, what we would basically call city-states. All right, now, the island of Sardinia and the area around Genoa was called the Kingdom of Sardinia under the control of the House of Savoy. You see this, Northwestern Italy and Sardinia. We know Corsica had been under control of France since 1769, so Corsica Island is not going back to Italy now or ever again, not then or ever again. But Sardinia Island and the area we call Piedmont is under the control of the House of Savoy. Okay, now there's this idea in Italy after 1850, mostly it's Freemasons, which they have their own agenda, but they are leading this, what they call a resurgimento, a resurgence of nationalism. Because the Italians, remember, we used to have a big European empire called the Roman Empire, speaking Latin, right? What do we have now? This jigsaw puzzle? And you had leaders like Giuseppe Mazzini, and they're pushing for this, right? But now the reactionary leaders, these are the people that want no changes, they're not gonna tolerate it. So they don't want these kind of people down there in Southern Italy. You go down to Southern Italy, start talking about nationalism, you're gonna get killed because the Bourbons in the kingdom of the two Sicilies have no ambitions to take over any territory. They're not strong. They don't want it. They just wanna hold on to what they have, which is not a bad area. It's all of Southern Italy, nice country, okay? farming country, no real technology, they don't care, they're making a little bit of money, they're happy, no change, it's fine. Northern Italy is more forward looking, you know, they want more in the industry, you know, uh, modern technology under the various rulers, fine, that's no problem. None of them are gonna expand, but there's one expansionist Italian family and that's the House of Savoy in Sardinia. And their idea is that Italy should be united. And naturally, under what family, of course, the dynasty of the House of Savoy. So the King of Sardinia under the House of Savoy, these Victor Emmanuels, who stayed in power until 1946, by the way, they want Italy to be united under their control. So they've got this agenda. We want to take over all of Italy. There's one little problem. They're weak. 
how are they going to take over all of Italy? They have no strength. They're going to need help. So you're going to see, under the leadership of Count Camilla di Cavour, the prime minister of the Kingdom of Sardinia, they're going to make this step-by-step -step series of moves in order to take over all of Italy. It seems preposterous, like it could never happen, but they're pretty, they're pretty clever. And they've got connections all around Italy, so they're, they're supporting rebels in the kingdom of, of Sicily, the kingdom of the two Sicilies. And these rebels are what we would call today terrorists, secret society, mostly all Freemasons, of course, and they, they go around killing people, and they shoot them with rifles, carbine, carbine rifles, and, and, and they do other nasty things, and they're called the Carbonari. Today they're called the Mafia. But they go around doing this, so they're killing people. And then the king of Sicily is saying, we got to track these people down and kill them. So it's like this little struggle going on down there. And the king of Sicily doesn't like the king of Sardinia because he knows what he's up to. So they're kind of arch enemies. Now, why do you suppose Austria would be an arch enemy of Sardinia? Well, of course they're going to be their arch enemy because Austria controls Tyrol, Lombardy and Venezia. They don't want to lose those territories. Sardinia wants those territories. So Sardinia is going to always be plotting against Austria. Remember that. Okay. Now I'm going to talk about Russia and you say, what does this have to do with Italy? Well, a whole lot in, in, in an ancillary way. It's so complicated, but not so complicated. Okay. Russia, under the Tsars, the Romanov family, had this old-time beef against the Ottoman Turks since 1453, when the Turkish hordes, you want to call them Muslim hordes, came pouring into Southeastern Europe and Western Asia in the 1400s. They took over all these Christian areas, Catholic and Eastern Orthodox, but mainly Eastern Orthodox. Oh, man. But these... Uh, these Byzantine Romans, these Eastern Romans, they didn't go down. They didn't go down too easy. So they were fighting to the death, right? So even in 1453, when the Turks, the Muslims, start pouring into the city of Constantinople, today Istanbul, even the last Roman emperor, Constantine the Eleventh, was fighting on the wall, fighting to the death in the city. He was killed. His niece escaped. His closest family member escaped and wound up in Moscow. Okay. Where she married into the royal family in Moscow. Ivan decided that if he was gonna marry the closest rel relative of the last Roman emperor, then rightfully their child would be no longer a grand prince of Moscow, but the Caesar of Moscow, Tsar, the Russian word is Tsar of Moscow. So what did Ivan say in the 1400s? Two Romes have fallen. Rome, set in 476. The Eastern Rome, Constantinople, they even, actually the official name was New Rome, renamed Constantinople after Constantine the Great. And a third Rome has risen, Moscow. So now they start to refer to themselves as czars, Caesars. So they look, the Russians look at themselves as the third Rome, the rightful heirs of the Roman Empire. <clears throat> now you say that's craziness. I know, well, that's how they looked at it. And they see themselves as the protector of the Eastern European culture, the Greek culture. They have the Greek alphabet, Cyrillic, from Cyril and Methodius the two uh, Eastern Christian um, missionaries. They have the Eastern Orthodox religion, so they're Eastern European oriented. And Russia sees themselves at the, as the protectors of the Eastern Christians. Well, what did we say in previous videos? Great Britain always had this idea that they're gonna run the world. We're running the world. And any country that would challenge them is gonna get hit. 
who was the first challenger? France. And France kept getting hit. And after 1815, France just gives up and says, well, we're tired of losing wars to Great Britain. You know, just forget it. So France starts to kind of partner with Great Britain because it's just not worth it. But after 1815, the British start to put a bad eye on Russia. And I mean, they put a bad eye on Russia because they look at Russia as a threat. This country could be a threat to British power. Now, was Russia trying to overthrow Great Britain and take their colonies? No, they were not. But they were seen as a threat because they had a big empire and they, they wanted more. In the East, not, not in the British territories, but the British start to make moves against Russia. So there's a growing tension all throughout the 1800s after 1815 between Great Britain and Russia. And this is like the main flashpoint all throughout that century and today as evidenced by what's going on in Syria, that goes all the way back to this. Now, um, Russia actively encouraged these Eastern Europeans to rise up against the Turks because they looked at the Turks as sort of like an illegitimate country. It doesn't deserve to be there. We want these Turks out and we want to rebuild the great Greek culture in Southeastern Europe and Western Asia, naturally under our sphere of influence. So starting in the 1830s, there were a series of uprisings in Eastern Europe against the Turks. The first country to make the big uprising was Greece. The Greeks started to revolt against the Turks in the 1830s. Now, the Turks, they were bad guys. No one's saying they weren't bad guys. These Muslims would take over your country and they wouldn't like kill everybody. They would just kidnap the children, the boys, the Christian boys, and make them join the Turkish army special forces, where they would raise them as from little kids to be these fanatic Muslims, and they called them, the, you know, the Janissaries. Then they would take all the white women, you know, the European women, and put them in harems and use them as sex slaves. And then if you were a Christian, you didn't have to convert to Turkish. You could just pay a tax, the Jizra, a penalty tax for not worshiping the great Allah. Jews, they left them alone as long as they paid this Muslim tax. And in fact, many Jews were in the Turkish government. They had many Christians in the Turkish government. If you paid your little tax, and uh, one thing about the Ottomans, they were ruthless murderers, but they, they weren't too prejudiced so much. Like uh, if you were a Jew and you could administrate, you could be a big shot in the empire and in fact, be very wealthy. And if you were a Christian, Catholic or Eastern Orthodox, and you were a good administrator, you could be a big shot in the empire. So they didn't like outlaw Christianity or Islam. As long as you paid your taxes and you didn't make trouble, they're gonna leave you alone, okay? Maybe you'd be even be, even be in cahoots with them. And they were so corrupt, so if you, you might not mind stealing money either. So that's the way that worked, okay? So they had a pretty big empire to stretch from Egypt, north to Romania, and from, at one time, Italy, east to Persian, and they never could take over Persia. And in fact, the Turkish empire got weak. <laughs> this is even back to the days of the Roman empire, the Roman empire got weak to a large extent, wasting their, try their time trying to take over the Persian empire. And the Turks did the same thing. They fought so many battles along the Tigris and Euphrates river, trying to take over the Persian empire, which we today call Iran. It kept going on because Iran and Iraq were always fighting even until 1988. So that, that, that was sort of like a long-term battle, right? Well, okay, so the Greeks rise up against the Turks in the 1830s. Now the Turks, you know, if you were helping them steal money and all of that, they're gonna, they're gonna leave you alone. But if you tried to rise up, watch out, they're gonna massacre everybody. Like good, you know, they were good Muslim. All right, now, so the Greeks rise up against the Turks. The Turks say, oh, well, we know how to handle this. They start, they start sending in troops and they killing everybody, raping all the women, of course, blowing up, you know, destroying all the houses, killing all the Christians, like mass murder. I mean, they're, they're really good at mass murder, these Muslim Turks. Well, Russia has their excuse now. Russia says, oh, look at this, terrible. Look what these Turks are doing, these damnable Muslims, but that's it. And they start warning the Turks, although they were probably behind it all along, but they start warning the Turks, you stop treating these Christians so bad. And the Turks say, don't, don't tell us what to do in our empire. And so the Tsars say, oh, well, okay. 
we were planning to do this anyway. So the Russia launches a huge attack in 1832 into Romania, into Bulgaria, and they start lighting the Turks up. Well, the British and the French get a little nervous because they don't really care what happened to Greeks. They don't care about Greek people. And they, sh they seem to be indifferent to all the mass murder, frankly. But the, there's a big media storm. Back then, they didn't have the internet, but there's still a media storm like, look, why are you so indifferent? So the British and the French eventually say, uh, plus they don't want Russia taking over everything. So they decide they're going to intervene and stop the Turks. So there's this big coalition, Russia, France, Great Britain, and they go in and they tell the Turks, leave the Greeks alone. The Turks say, don't tell us what to do. So there's a little war and they easily defeat Turkey and little Greece gets its independence now, smaller than today. But now a new independent kingdom, the kingdom of Greece, but they don't have a king, so they import a German, <laughs> a German ruler to be the king of Greece. And the kings of Greece stayed in power until 1967 when they got thrown out. And then in 74, officially uh, declared no longer kings. And the king of Greece is still alive today, but he lives in Italy. He's an old man, and he doesn't seem to have any ambition to take his country back. But uh, anyway, The little country of Greece comes about. Now, Greece is naturally going to be oriented toward Russia because Russia was the main country to help them be free. Now, the way Russia wanted to do this, they wanted Romania and Bulgaria to be free of the Turks as well. But see, the British and the French, they weren't really there to help the Turks with their navies. That was they, That's what they were there obstens ostensibly to do. <laughs> What they were really there to do is make sure Russia doesn't take over everything, really to block Russia. So they, they start making some complaints that Russia's getting too strong. So Russia had to back off and they were not allowed to free Romania and Bulgaria. Romania remains a Turkish province, but a semi, or what, what you want to call a self-governing Turkish territory. Same thing with Bulgaria. In other words, they get more self-government, but they're still under the control of the Turks and the Russians don't like it. But there's, this is a step forward. It's a step forward. And then Egypt, when all this chaos is going, the Egyptians under Muhammad Ali, not the Cassius Clay, you know, they stole that name, but the real Muhammad Ali, the governor of Egypt rises up against the Turks and attacks the Turks and Egypt gets self-government under the Turks. Still a Turkish province, but the rulers of Egypt are really in more control than the Turks. Okay, so you can see the Turkish Empire of the Ottoman Turkish. The Ottoman Turks are starting to collapse. You say, what does this have to do with Italy? Just be patient. You see, this is not a video that can go quick. It's going to break out again. There was some controversy down in Jerusalem the Holy Land, over who's going to guard the ancient Christian sites, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, where Jesus was buried, the church, where, the church of the Nativity, where Jesus was born in Bethlehem, and all of this. The Turks don't really mind these Christian heritage sites because it brought in a lot of tourists, even back to the days of the Middle Ages. These Christians would make pilgrimage, pilgrimages to Judea, and they would spend a lot of money, and the Turks, hey, they're cool with that because that makes money. It brings in money. But there was some argument over who's supposed to be the protectors of this. Russia says we're the protectors of the Holy Land. But see, now Napoleon III, Louis Napoleon, decides, no, I'll be the protector of the Catholics over there. He's going to take the Catholic position. Well, naturally, the Russians are going to take the Eastern Orthodox position. They still have fistfights in these churches today between priests of both factions. This is no joke. There's still tension today over who should run it. I'm talking about 2015. Now, Napoleon III, he sticks his nose into this. Why? He's worried about the Christians in Palestine? No. Or Judea? No, he wants to make a name for himself. So the Russians tell Napoleon III, hey, you better buzz off, buddy. No, 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 he's going to spark a conflict. Now, meanwhile, there's this ongoing feud between the Russians and the Turks over the border. And Russia and the Turks go to war again in 1853 over the border, and the Russians attack the Turks. Well, the Russians are going to wipe out the Turks. That's what's going to happen. And the Russians start 
blasting the Turks. Napoleon III, France, and Great Britain used this as an excuse to attack Russia. Now the Russians are appalled. They say, look at this situation. Here are two Christian countries, Great Britain and France, that are going to intervene to take the side of this evil Muslim empire, the Turks, to fight a Christian country, Russia, where we ought to all team up and wipe out the Muslims and take back all of the Holy Land and chase them back to chase the Muslims completely out from Iraq all the way to Africa. But the British, so now we have a war that breaks out in 1853, Great Britain, France, and the Ottoman Empire versus over here, the Russian Empire. And where's the battlefield in the Crimean Peninsula, which today is part of Russia again since, since 2014. So the battle is in the Black Sea and on land in the Crimean Peninsula. Peninsula. Now Great Britain, France, and Turkey, I guess, but Great Britain and France figure, well, the Russia's got a lot of internal problems. We can just push them out of the way. And the Russians say, no, no, we're not going anywhere. So it turns into this big stalemate on the Crimean Peninsula, and it lasts three years, 1853 to 1856. The war drags on for three years. Great Britain and France are not able to kick the Russians out of the peninsula. On the other hand, the Russians are not able to push them off the peninsula. So what you basically have is trench warfare and a whole lot of people getting killed, being led by very incompetent old commanders left over from the Napoleonic Wars even, who should have been retired and don't know what they're doing. And a lot of people are getting killed. And that's where Florence Nightingale got famous for trying to treat injured war, you know, injured uh, soldiers. But anyway, he's still saying, what does this have to do with Italy? Okay, here we go. The king of Sardinia, the House of Savoy, Victor Emmanuel, decides, hey, let me help y'all fight the Russians. Why? He's got some great interest in what happens in Crimea and the Middle East? No, but he needs friends. So the British and French say, well, okay. So in 1855, as the war is ending, the last year of the war, the Kingdom of Sardinia jumps in as an ally against Russia. Can they really contribute a whole lot? No. But they send some troops and they help fight. So they're one of the allies. You see, now he's thinking. Count Camilla di Cavour is thinking, and the King of Italy, uh, of Sardinia is thinking, we can use this. So they call the war off in 1856. They, they call the war off. They just end the war and basically just call it even, kind of like in 1815 with the Americans and the British. And the French and British. And Sardinians and Turks go home and the Russians go home and they say, all right, fine. That's it for now. All right. <laughs> you see how you have to you have to explain it right or you just soon not explain it at all. Or it won't make sense. So now we're back to Italy. 1859, three years after the Crimean War ended. So now Italy is in cahoots with Napoleon III. The king, I, I, I keep saying Italy, the king of Sardinia, excuse me, is telling Napoleon III. Now, see, we, we work together over there in Crimea, and Napoleon III is saying, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't care about you, but the king of Sardinia tells Louis Napoleon, I need some help. I want to fight Austria and take Lombardy and Venezia. Louis Napoleon says, what is that? I don't care about that. That doesn't mean anything to me. Go fight him. Good luck. Hope you win. You probably get destroyed. He said, "Yeah, but I could use France's help." Now, France had been an old-time enemy of Austria, going back hundreds of years. They had an old-time beef over territory in in Europe. But Napoleon said, "I'm not helping you. There's nothing you can do for me." But now, Sardinia knows that France had had its eye on two Western Italian territories. Nice, Nice, N-I-C-E, looks like Nice, and Savoy, above Nice, along the Alps mountains, right close to the little micro state of Monaco. Now, Napoleon III says, well, now, look, I will help you if you can give me Savoy and Nice to France. Victor Emmanuel says, and Cavour, Camilla de Cavour say, okay, that's a deal. If you help us take over Lombardy and Venezia against Austria, you can have 
these two territories. So he's willing to sacrifice Western territories of Italy to get the whole rest of Italy. So they trump up this, you know, bunch of bunk, and they come up with some excuse to attack Austria in 1859. So they have this Austrian, French, Sardinian war. 1859, they attack Austria. Well, Austria is never was never strong. I mean, if you look at the history of Austria, they basically never won a war in their entire history. They had this big empire, but they never won a war. They're just weak. So they attack Austria and France and Sardinia start beating Austria. They kick them out of Lombardy. Yay! <laughs> Sardinia say, yay, we're taking over Northern Italy. Now, when they get ready to go into Venezia, though, Napoleon, he's got his territories. So he says, well, uh, look, I settled my problems with Austria. You're on your own, so screw you. He leaves. <laughs> he just leaves. Typical Napoleon. He's out there for himself. He's not out there for you. He's not he's not joining you to help you. He's joining you to help himself. France gets their two territories. And so the king of Sardinia is screaming foul. You cheated me. Napoleon says, do something about it. Oh, well, I can't because I'm weak. So now Austria counterattacks and uh, Sardinia has to get out of the war. All right, all right, all right, all right, uncle. They cry uncle. So they don't get Venezia, Venice, but they get Lombardy. And then they, meanwhile, they've invaded all these northern Italian states, Lucca, Modena, Parma, all of that. And at the same time, down in the kingdom of Sicily, there's this rebel, Giuseppe Garibaldi, a guy who is a professional revolutionary, sort of like Che Guevara, right? Look, he's involved with the Freemasons. His, his, his troops are called the red shirts. They wear red shirts, not on accident. They could have picked any color, but of course, there's a reason for that. And they start to rise up against the king of Sicily. And the red shirts of Garibaldi start to win. And he's in coordination with the king of Sardinia. So they, the king of, of Sicily is forced to flee. The Bourbon king of Sicily flees the country. And so Garibaldi, this rebel leader, you may have seen pictures wearing the red cap and this long beard. He's going north. He's heading north at the same time, Victor Emmanuel and the Sardinian troops are heading south. And they meet in the center of Italy. Bam, right in the middle. And there's a question if there's going to be a war between the two, because it seemed like Garibaldi wasn't satisfied just to be a hired rebel. He Maybe he might want to be the president of Italy or something like that. But, uh, you know, the king of Sardinia has got his own plans. If Garibaldi makes the wrong move, he's going to be dead. That's what's going to happen. He's going to get whacked. But Garibaldi's a cool dude. He's, he's satisfied to just take the money and run. So when they meet up at the meeting point, Garibaldi says, he greets Victor Emmanuel and says, hail Victor Emmanuel, King of Italy. Emmanuel likes that. Good, good boy. Now you're gonna get paid and you're not gonna get killed. And there'll be statues all over Italy for the great Garibaldi, liberator of Italy under my tutelage, of course. So they have this sham election, so to speak, and um, more or less, and all of Northern Italy and Southern Italy unite as the Kingdom of Italy in 1860. And who's the king? You got it, Victor Emmanuel, the House of Savoy, is no longer King of, Savo of Sardinia. He's now the King of Italy. And now we're gonna take over Rome from the Pope and take all of, all of those papal states. So now the Italian forces, no longer Sardinia, the Italian troops start marching towards Rome and we're gonna conquer. And there's gonna be this progressive country uh, with a parliament and Freemasonry and the people will rule in democracy and none of these old clergymen and all those old rules are gonna bind us and we're gonna have this modern progressive king and it's gonna be wonderful. But there's one little problem. Our old friend Napoleon III, Louis Napoleon, He's trying to make a name for himself, and he wants all the Catholics in France to like him, even though he's only nominally Catholic and is not a practicing Catholic. But he's so sly. He says, oh, no, you can't attack the Pope, the Holy Father. He needs protection. So guess whose army shows up right when the Italian troops are on the verge of conquering Rome? You got it. The army of Napoleon III, the Emperor of France, shows up and they protect the Holy Father, the Pope. 
and Victor Emmanuel says, "What? What's happening here? You, I want your troops out of Italy." And Napoleon says, "Push them out. You want to have a war with France? What's going to happen? What's going to happen if you do that? You know, Austria is coming back and taking everything you stole from them, and then we're going to take a whole lot of stuff. So, you really want to do this?" And Victor Emmanuel decides, "I don't really want to do this." So France keeps troops in central Italy around Rome, protecting this area around Rome that continues to be the Papal States under the control of the Pope with protection of French troops. And Italy's so angry, but there's not a whole lot they can, can do about it. They just fought a long war. They're not modernized yet, you know, so much. They don't have a strong army, so they gotta take it. And Napoleon III tells Victor Emmanuel, yeah, you gonna take it, you gotta take it, you gotta take it. Well, I don't have everything, but I got a lot of things. So Victor Emmanuel figures he'll just let it ride for now. Let France keep those troops in central Italy for now. But don't let yourself get caught slipping, Napoleon. You know what I mean? Don't let yourself get caught slipping. Well, Napoleon III is pretty stupid, so he's going to let himself get caught slipping. That leads us to Germany. Oh, well, well, well. Hey, Germany was not a united country. It was broken up into 39 states in 1815. Well, it's better than the, it, 1648 when it was over 300 states. In 1648, Germany was broken up into over 300 states, some big like Bavaria and some tiny, smaller than some counties in America. And some of these states were broken into five, six, seven, 18 pieces. So Germany was not a united country. And as a matter of fact, even though they had the Holy Roman Empire with an emperor, you had to pay taxes when you crossed every border. You had to pay taxes, tariffs, across each border. So you imagine trade within Germany was very bad. It's sort of like the United States. Remember when the United States first started in 1776? If you wanted to you might have grown tobacco in South Carolina. You want to sell it to Massachusetts. You have to pay taxes when you cross each border. There was not interstate free trade, remember, until the new constitution in 1788. Now in Austria, their empire, Maria Theresa, the great archduchess of Austria, she's the one that consolidated trade within Austria, making a common trade zone. So now, that's why Austria got strong economically, because it was free trade within the empire. But Germany, <laughs> you have to pay taxes crossing each little border. So trade within Germany was like strangled. <laughs> Germany was still under the feudal system. They had feudal lords. They had serfs, you know, like slaves, white slaves, basically bound to the manor, just like in Russia. Germany was a very backward country, very bad technology, mostly rural. Nobody fears Germany in 1815. They're like a laughing stock. I mean, they admire their culture, their music, their, their sausages and their beer. But otherwise, they're never thought of as a threat to world peace. They don't bring back the empire in 1815, but they create something called the Holy, <laughs> the German Confederation, which is the borders of the old empire. So they bring back the borders minus the Austrian Netherlands, Belgium today. And they make the German Confederation. 39 states united with one thing in common. They speak German. They were the old Holy Roman Empire. And they're going to be a confederation. They're going to work together like a family of nations. Good idea. Now, do you think the rulers of these little states want many changes? In most cases, they do not. Austria rules much of southern Germany with their Austrian empire, and they're not looking to change anything. They're reactionary. They, they have big territories, and they're glad to keep them. But there's one state that does want changes, and this is Prussia, the kingdom of Prussia. Well, Prussia started as the Duchy of Brandenburg in, around Berlin in the Middle Ages. Oh, they weren't strong. They weren't strong. Later on, through a series of maneuvers, they inherited Prussia, this eastern territory around Konigsberg and the Mel, bordering 
the Russian Empire. So now it's called Brandenburg, Prussia. And then during the 1700s, Prussia was sort of like Savoy. They always got themselves involved with wars, but usually helping Great Britain. So they were smart. The Prussians would take the British side, meaning the winning side, and so they would get rewarded. And so eventually Prussia became the kingdom of Prussia, a British ally. No, they weren't doing it because they loved Great Britain. They were doing it because they could help themselves out. So over the years, every time they would have some big war, like the War of the uh, Spanish Succession or the War of the Austrian Succession or the War of the American Revolution and all of this, the, the Prussians would be on the British side and they would gain more territory. So by the time of 1815, Prussia was a huge kingdom that stretched from the Russian border around Konigsberg in East Prussia all the way west, broken up into different pieces, to the French border. Naturally, the French were a little uneasy about Prussia because they are right up against their border and they're not weak. And they're, they were very militaristic. The Hohenzollern family, the Hohenzollerns, the dynasty of Prussia in Berlin, they were very, very interested in military science. And so their focus was on a very strictly organized land army, landwehr, with elite soldiers and special forces. So they became noted for being a very um, fantastic fighting force and allied with Great Britain. And the British family even owned a territory within the German Confederation called the Kingdom of Hanover. The Kingdom of Hanover in North Central Germany was a, not a strong country, but it was dynastically tied to the British House of Hanover. Victoria, her, her uh, father and uncles, all of them, she was the granddaughter of George III, so they're, they're united now. But when Victoria came to the throne in 1837, there was a law in Germany that women could not rule Hanover, the Salic law. So the, the family branch broke apart. So the, king, the kingdom of Hanover was a different branch than the kingdom of Great Britain. So that's where that split. They were no longer tied dynastically after 1837. Okay. William of, of Prussia. He would like to be the German emperor, but then of course he can't pull that off. The Habsburgs down in Austria, they would like to be the German emperor, but they can't pull it off. So you can see where the rivalry is going to develop after 1815 between the Protestant Prussians and the Catholic Austrians. They both want to have domination over the rest of Germany. So they're going to always be plotting against each other, more or less. All right. Now, there was one part of the German Confederation that was not German speaking, and that was Bohemia and Moravia, the Kingdom of Bohemia under the Habsburgs. That's Czechia today, the Czech Republic. That was a Slavic area, but it was under the control of the Germans, so it was considered part of the German Confederation. <clears throat> All right. Well, the Prussians would not mind controlling Germany. Now, here's the steps we take towards German unification. There was an idea that the Prussians had early on, and the other German states had, in 1831, to unite trade within the empire, uh, the Confederation. And they adopted something called the Zollverein, which we would call a customs union, a trade union. The free trade area of Germany. So they, they would unite and say, anybody who wants to join this organization, if you join this trade pact, you could trade your goods between those states without paying the tax, a tariff. After 1831, more and more German states joined the Zollverein. Eventually, by 1866, all the states had joined it. So what do you think happens to technology and commerce and the economy of Germany in the mid-1800s? It explodes. The potential was there, and now it's happening. Germany starts to become this industrial giant. Iron, steel, trains, canals technology is just flourishing in germany so the germans say wow just think we're becoming this modernized country or collection of countries and the german economy becomes so impressive around the world with this free trade between the german states well yes there was a disruption in 1848 when the communists decide to have the uprising and it looked like they were going to take over all of germany 
And they even established a new republic in Frankfurt, and they called all of Germany, and they adopted the flag we know today, the black, red, and gold flag, the tricolor, always tricolor, freedom, you know, liberty, equality, and brotherhood. That's the motto of the Freemasons of Europe. Liberty, freedom from religion and the old rulers, equality, a brotherhood of man. Everybody's equal, except some are more equal than others, and fraternity. Okay, now, the conservative forces counterattack. They're stronger than the, ro the rebels think they are. And the conservatives, really conservative liberals, but the progressive, the conservative progressives counterattack and the, and, the, and the rebels are thrown out. And the man that rises to the top is a man named Prince Bismarck, Otto von. And anytime you hear that in German, von, that means a lord. He's one of those old feudal lords from Prussia, Otto von Bismarck, Lord Bismarck. And he works for the, the king of Prussia, as we would call him today, the prime minister. And he tells William, he says, look, I got this plan to unite all of Germany under Prussian control, but it's gonna be a real risky plan. We gotta be super careful because there's different countries like Great Britain, and France lurking around that don't want Germany to be united. So it's a real dangerous thing. It's very dangerous. We gotta be so careful, but we can pull it off, I think. So he's gonna be so ruthless, but careful, you see. Later German rulers were ruthless, but not careful, not careful. But Bismarck is ruthless. He doesn't mind war, he doesn't mind killing, but he's careful. He knows it's so dangerous. The territory he's operating in is so dangerous. So he's gonna take these little, what we call baby steps to unite Germany. Now in the next video, we're gonna talk about what happened with German unification. This is gonna to lead to so much trouble. And in fact, it's gonna to lead to World War I well, I think today it's better to call it the World War Part One and the World War Part Two, correct? It's gonna to lead to the World War Part One and the World War Part Two, which ran from 1914 to 1945 with a little break in between, about a 21 year break in between. So that's gonna be so interesting when we get to that. And then we're gonna see how Russia comes back into play and it's going it, it, to and it leads up to what's happening in Syria today even today everything we're talking about even today so it's good to know facts about history it's even better to understand the facts about history thank you for watching this production and get ready because pretty soon we're coming up with german unification nationalism nationalistic chain reactions part 3